Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the fabulous Dave Copland from Microsoft. Cheers, Frank. <laughs> oh, you're clapping now. <laughs> you won't be in 15 minutes. So, hi, I'm Dave uh, Copland from Microsoft. The first thing I have to tell you is I have a comedy job title because I am Microsoft UK's chief envisioning officer. Check me out. <laughs> job titles are important. You know job titles are important. I have this great job for Microsoft because my focus is not the lovely technology and products that we make, because we love to talk to you about those. My focus is about the human beings that use them. And we basically spend a lot of time thinking about the future, of our, about how human beings are going to want to live, work, and play. Because we think if we understand the future of human beings, we can be a lot more mindful about the kind of technology they're going to need, both in education but also in the world of work. So understand at a certain level, my job is about the future of humanity. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I figured if I'm going to have a job that's about the future of humanity, I deserve and I demand a job title with a certain degree of pomposity. <laughs> I think you'll see I've achieved that. I also, when I was a kid, I said to my mum, I said, Mum, one day I am going to be CEO at Microsoft. You just watch me. Some of you will be aware there's recently been a job opening for that position. This is still the only way I'm ever going to get that job title. <laughs> the other thing you need to know about me is I stand in front of you as an individual who's dedicated his entire career to the IT industry, 20 odd years in the world of IT. I have chosen to work for one of the world's largest technology companies. I have gone to the extremes of personal grooming to grow a beard and a ponytail. That's how committed I am to my industry. And guess what? I also quite like Star Trek. Right? Star Trek's really important, right? Because when you're a young, naive, gullible kid like what I was, it teaches this really important lesson that technology is supposed to be a force for good in our society. It's supposed to be this thing that enables human beings to rise up and achieve more than they could do on their own. That's why I signed up for a career in IT. That's why I chose to work for Microsoft. But my problem is those 20 odd years in our industry, in the IT industry. Because I look around at how we all use technology and I don't see this great liberating force. I see a prison. I see something that constrains how we work, even controls how we think. That's not my future. I want a different future. And it starts with education. It starts with how we think about technology and education. But a lot of my job is actually about the future of work. And I think the future of work is the perfect context for why, how we should think about education. Because the role of education is to prepare our children for their future. And if we're going to prepare them for our future, we better bloody understand how the future of work is going to be different. Because let me tell you now, the, day, the way we work today is not working. We still work in our organizations based on a whole bunch of principles that are essentially established in the Industrial Revolution. The whole command and control goes back to concepts from the church and the military. We have this concept about presenteeism. We have to be inside the container of our, of our organization, the physical place, when actually the technology enables us to work differently. We want our individuals to be agile. We want them to think for themselves. And yet the whole infrastructure of work does not allow for that. And what we have to do is we have to realize that the biggest constraint we face as a society in our ability to get technology to work for us is not the technology itself. It's what my dad calls the interface between the keyboard and the chair. It's us. It's the human beings. Because it's our low expectations of what technology can do that constrain everything that we could do with technology. And we have to address that. And education is the place that we need to do it. Because the future of work that we're heading into will be ambiguous by default. It will be uncertain. We will need people who work in organizations who are malleable, can react to that ambiguity, can deal with that uncertainty of what might be happening. We want to move away from a world of organizations where the structure is rigid and the corporate hierarchy exists to a world of intelligent organisms. Because organisms are brilliant, right? They react, they evolve, they, they, they're sort of malleable, they bend. This is the organization of the future. But if we need people who are able to live in that kind of organization, we better think about what we're doing to them when it comes to education, because what we're doing today does not prepare them for that. It does not give them the core skills that they need to make that happen. And then there are some key technologies that are coming at us pretty quickly, and we need to understand them because they will completely transform our relationship with technology as human beings. Much of this is based around a concept called machine learning, which is essentially how algorithms are made. And I'm telling you now, machine learning will change everything that we do with computing. Because machine learning is incredibly powerful. It starts, or it started, do you remember the first time when you typed in a search query and it auto-completed the query for you? And if you were like me, that was a bit spooky. You were freaked out by that. But actually, all that's happening is it's statistical-based pattern recognition. So the search engine just simply says, based on the characters you've just typed in, 
The statistical probability of you going on to complete the sentence like this is 93%, so I'm going to suggest it to you. But that principle of using data and spotting patterns in the data enables us to cre create some incredible services, things that will transform what we do with technology. My favorite example of this currently is something we demonstrated two months ago, three months ago now, which is using the power of machine learning to do real-time speech-to-speech language translation via Skype. On one end of the call, we had a gentleman speaking German. On the other, we had a lady speaking English. Gentleman speaks German, lady hears English. Lady speaks English, gentleman hears German. No human being, real-time, absolute translation. Now think about that, right? And it's early days for this technology, but by the end of this calendar year, you'll be able to download a beta of that service that basically means you can spark up Skype, and you basically, there's a drop-down box, and you say, well, what language would you like to speak on your next call? And there's a choice of some 152 languages. On the principle of that kind of technological transformation, I've got an eight-year-old son who's going to school. Do I bother to get him to learn a foreign language? Right? Chances are, when he gets into his world of work, it's going to be a redundant skill. Now, I get that's provocative before you start tweeting, <laughs> right? <laughs> Lots of reasons why we learn foreign languages, but I just want to give you a sense of the transformation that this stuff has, because it's going to change what we do. But if you want to understand how it works, you'll also understand both its limitations and its power. So I've shown you its power. Let me talk to you briefly about its limitations. The way that machine learning works is based on pattern recognition. And we all do this, right? Innately, as human beings, we, we manage and curate patterns. My favorite example is this slide behind me, because this comes from an email that did the rounds back in 2003. It's based on some proper grown-up academic research from Cambridge University that basically says, as long as you speak English, I can, and I, and I keep the first and last characters of a word in the right place, I can mix up the rest of the letters, and you will be able to read the text. Is that true? Can you bang that out? Right. So what's happening there is completely counterintuitive to how you're taught language at school. Because when we're at school, we're taught language is logical. Language follows rules. We're taught things like I before E except after C. But what we're not taught is that there are 923 exceptions to that rule. There are more bloody exceptions to that rule than there are to the rule itself. Language is not logical. So the way that you deal with that as a human being is you curate a pattern of language. For your entire life, you will be tending that pattern. And when the brain gets presented with something like this, the brain calls on that pattern and says, help me. Help me understand what's going on there. What do you think happens when I show this slide to someone who's just beginning to learn to speak English? Or I show it to my son who's just forming his own language skills? They can't make sense of it because they haven't got the pattern. And this is the limitation of machine learning, is they're only as good as the patterns that they're provided with. And we need human beings to create the patterns, to connect the patterns, to provide context for the patterns. Much of this stuff is fed by data, and data is absolutely crucial. And one of the core skills we're going to need as a society, and this is everybody, is we're going to need to curate what I call a data culture. This is about everybody understanding the power of data. Now listen, I'm not asking for everybody to become a data scientist, although we need a few of those. This is understanding that we're going to be presented with more and more powerful tools in a simpler and simpler fashion. It's a bit like if you remember 10 or 15 years ago, if you wanted to write a formula, a mathematical formula in Excel, you kind of needed seven manuals, a PhD, and about three weeks of spare time. And if you were lucky, if you were really lucky, you might get the syntax right and it would work. Well, what happens today? I click on a button in the ribbon, and it auto-completes the formula for me. The same thing's happening with data interrogation tools. We're moving to a world, we have things like Power BI, and this is not a product plug, it's just an example. Power BI is basically an algorithm that enables you to make a natural language query to completely unstructured, chaotic data. It means that normal, regular human beings can type in something like, tell me who sold the most in the last three months. And what happens is it gets passed over to Bing, and Bing knows all about natural language, and it says, right, okay, well, based on what the human has asked me, that probably means time period equals three months, and we're looking for gross revenue. It forms a database query. Human being doesn't have to worry about that. It doesn't have to be a DB admin. doesn't have to worry about the syntax of it. can just do what human beings do. And in a world where those tools are available and accessible to us, we need a culture in our people, in our society, to understand what they can do, to be able to ask the right questions. There's that great quote from Pablo Picasso back in the mid-60s when he's being interviewed by some art magazine in Paris. And he was asked about computers at the time. And he said, computers, they're useless. They can only give you answers. I want something that can help me with finding the right questions. This is the data culture. This is the kind of skills that our people are going to need. But there are some other more subtle things that we also need to think about. I worry a lot about the way that we sleepwalk into our use of technology. I've written a couple of books on this topic. And by the way, you should know I'm a cheap date. They're all available for free on Amazon, much to my publisher's disgust. 
And the thing is, we talk about crucial skills for the 21st century. We talk about things that we need to do. Too much of the focus is put on multitasking and things like that. And multitasking is basically a lie. We cannot multitask as human beings. The crucial skill we all need in the 21st century is simply this. It's being able to make positive, conscious choices about where technology can help us and, crucially, where it can't. And in all of those examples where the technology can't help us, we should put it down and leave it alone. But we should equally be able to spot them and actually opportunities and engage with the technology. Simple examples. Let me give you the concept of mindfulness, right? So there's lots of talk. Mindfulness is a really trendy topic at the moment. Mindfulness is about making good choices. But I want you to think of mindfulness as a spectrum, right? The far extreme of one end of the spectrum is what I would call the West Coast US definition of mindfulness, where it's down to Zen meditation and all that. I'm not knocking that. If that's your bag, that's great. But what I really want us all to think about is the other end of the spectrum, and that's the British version of mindfulness, which is about just being bloody pragmatic, right? So if you're the sort of person that likes to sit in a meeting with your laptop open taking notes, right? And we all know that taking notes in a meeting with your laptop basically means ca catching up on your email or doing your Facebook. Don't have the meeting. It's a pointless waste of time. Don't be down the pub or the cafe with your friends and family checking out your Facebook status. Pointless waste of time. You've got to choose your moments where the technology can help. These are skills that we need to help people with because today they don't have them. The other thing, I believe our future belongs to creativity. The future of our society belongs to the ability of our people to be creative. And again, we don't create enough space in our lives for creativity. And we don't create enough space in two dimensions. The first is a physical dimension. We don't have the physical space for people to be truly creative as individuals because we stuff them in open plan offices, busy, chaotic, noisy environments where actually the human brain cannot be creative because there's too many distractions. We need to encourage people to be able to make the right choices about the kind of work that they're about to do and to be in the right location to do that. So if you have some cognitive work to do, you should be in a space that enables you to be cognitive. But the second dimension is crucially important, and it's about having the mental space for creativity. This is about making sure that in the day, you have some time when you're not looking at a screen, some time when you allow your brain to do what it does best, which is to process all of the random stuff that you've, nearly, that you've seen and done over the last 24 hours and make sense of it. These are the kinds of skills that we need to curate in our people, and certainly when it comes to education. But then there's some technology that can help. And some of this is nothing new. We know about this. But I want to give you a particular lens on it. Anybody think about the most transformational technology that we've probably seen in education over the last five years? Anybody? Shout it out. Office 365 student advantage? Yes, excellent. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> For me, it's this. It's Minecraft. Right? Minecraft is a perfect example of creativity because I look at how people use Minecraft. And it took me a while, right? and I had to help get some help from my son to, to really help me see this. But Minecraft is a beautiful example of digital creativity. If you see the things that kids are doing, both in terms of how they're learning themselves, self-directed learning with these things called books, as well as the internet, it's amazing. And you see the kind of stuff that they create. It's just intoxicating, and yet too many people are oblivious to that kind of creativity. I want to tell you very briefly about what the uh, birthday present that my son gave me this year. He actually came to me, Dad, Dad, I've got a birthday present. Come down here. Takes me to my Xbox. Well, what's this about? He takes me to the Minecraft world that he's created. And in that Minecraft world that he's created, he has created a perfect replica of the Google logo. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> that's a bit odd. But then he says, that's not it, Dad. Have a look at this. And next to the Google logo was a little red button. It said, happy birthday, Dad. Please press me. And do you know what he'd done? He'd embedded TNT under the logo. <laughs> and I pressed the button, kaboom. Best <laughs> birthday present ever. Right? So this is, the kind of <laughs> this is the kind of creativity that this kind of technology enables. And Minecraft is just the beginning, right? We have other things coming. And this is another example. There's a, there's a game that's going to be launched in October called Project Spark. And again, what you see in Project Spark is this perfectly blank canvas that takes kids to the next level because they can program every single element of the level. They can get in and they can, every element that could be there could be applied with some logic, basically when, if-when logic. So if this happens, then do that. 
This is creating a generation of kids who have aspiration to want to be creative, to want to have control over their environment, to want to be able to configure and personalize things. These are the skills that we should be curating in our society because the technology is making it engaging and fun. And the thing we have to figure out with all of this is how do we help them with that? How do we get the, the teachers to really understand what this can do for us? So look, understanding all of this, my whole pitch is about how do we enable human beings to live up to the potential of technology. This is not the Terminator, right? The internet is not Skynet. I have a very different view of our future, and it's simply this. We have to find a way to get our society to live up to that potential, to stand tall and proud. If that's me, Mum, tell her I'm busy. Uh, stand tall and proud, stand on the shoulders of the digital giants that we've created to create great things. And it's no different, we've been having this debate for a long time, right? When I was a kid, when I did my maths O level, and if you don't know what an O level is, it's kind of like a GCSE but harder, right? <laughs> Thank you. It's always good with the old farts, that one. And it was a time in our society where we were debating the role of pocket calculators in the education of our children. As a result of that debate in our society, I did my maths bloody O-level with a logbook and a slide rule. Let me tell you, I'm a better mathematician with a calculator than I am with a slidey bit of plastic and a tabulated bit of paper. Yes, I need to know the basics of arithmetic, but the technology lifts my capabilities. So the debate we need to have today about the future of technology and education is what are those basic skills? What are those core skills? And let me tell you, they are not things like Word and PowerPoint and Excel or even specific code languages because I guarantee you by the time those people enter their world of work they will not be the same tools it's things like critical thinking it's deep thinking it's the ability to communicate effectively and collaborate these are the core skills the debate is with the human beings and if we get that right we'll enable them to rise up ladies and gentlemen thank you very much <clears throat> thanks thanks very much Dave great stuff